This is research having to do with understanding electron transfer at the microbe mineral interface, specifically for the metal reducer Schuonella onidensis. This first picture is just an illustration of how bacteria interface with solid phase solid phases in the ground. These are metal oxide minerals bearing iron 3. Next slide shows a cartoon that captures the context for the research and the motivation. Cells uh, are thought to respire on, directly on these oxides by making physical contact and then at the interface between the cellular envelope and metal oxides such as iron 2, iron 3 bearing oxides. There's an electron transfer enables the, the cell to respire and that interfacial electron transfer at the molecular level is very poorly understood at the present, but it has a lot to do with the functioning of these microorganisms in the ground and their ability to survive. So uh, we are trying to understand those details. Focusing in on uh, the enzymes that are doing this electron transfer business at the interface, which are known as cytochromes. So these are heme-bearing proteins that the cells express at that interface specifically for efficient electron transfer. So what we are doing, as shown on the next slide, is taking advantage of emerging atomic structures of proteins, these cytochromes, to do molecular simulations to understand the rates of electron transfer from within these proteins, from heme group to heme group, but then also across interfaces, from protein-protein interfaces to protein-mineral interfaces as well. The structural information that you see here on the slide, this kind of structural information is really limited. And so when we get a structure like this, which takes years to produce, we're quite happy from the molecular simulation side of things. This provides us with all the atomic coordinates that are needed to make good guesses as to where to place all the atoms. and also gives us the uh, topology of the protein, which tells us something hopefully insightful about how the uh, electron transfer can proceed. And so what you see here on this slide is protein called MTRF from strain MR1. It's a four-domain decaheme cytochrome, and the hemes are better seen in the, uh, in the next slide where most of the polypeptide has been faded into gray. You see 10 hemes enumerated on the graph. In principle, these 10 hemes each are stepping stones for electron transfer along a wire, what has been called by the experimental team a staggered cross, which you can see in eight heme wire from 10 to 5 running from top to bottom and you can see a 4 heme or a tetraheme wire from 7 to 2 or vice versa or running left to right and so these wires are thought to be uh, conduits for electron transfer and what we are doing with simulation is to calculate the quantities needed to predict the rates of electron transfer between each adjacent heme pair so and this is just a picture of what one of those heme pairs might look like to give some context, we have an electron on one heme, a reduced heme shown in blue, where the iron is effectively in a ferrous state. It's a low spin heme. And that extra electron on that heme is then transferred to the adjacent oxidized heme, and that's the electron transfer pair. And what is not shown here is the protein backbone that surrounds these pairs and also solvent water, which for various pairs will have different degrees of coverage. But what we do is uh, molecular dynamic simulations uh, on these heme pairs with the full protein and solvent water explicitly expressed. And we calculate, in the context of Marcus electron transfer theory, the electron transfer rate. One of the main quantities for that is the redox potential. It's the free energy, as shown on the next slide, the free energy of oxidation or reduction of each of those hemes, each of the 10 hemes. What we're seeing on this slide is the calculated free energy profile using molecular dynamics and a technique called thermodynamic integration to understand the various redox potentials of the hemes within MTRF. And on the axis on the left are red lines, which are locations for redox potentials as measured by protein film voltammetry in MTRF, but in a, in a way that is, can be described as indiscriminate, in other words, the redox potential ladder is known, but the assignments to specific hemes is not from experiment. And in the traces, what you're seeing are the calculated uh, heme redox potentials with assignments. So on the left being heme 10, and on the right being heme 5. These are two endpoints of the octaheme wire running top to bottom. 
And the tetraheme wire is shown more or less in the middle where you have heme 7 connected to heme 2 through 6 and 1. What this landscape shows is effectively two things. You have two low potential hills at hemes 9 and 4. So transfer from 10 to 5 would have to go through 9 and 4 with hill heights of about 200 millivolts or so. And this is not too bad. This is pretty surmountable from an electron transfer perspective. And then you have basically a basin from between 4 and 9 where electrons could be imagined to accumulate in the hemes that are in more or less the interior of the protein with a strong sink at 7. 7 being the most electropositive, hence the uh, last one to be oxidized. You could think of 7 as a sink and uh, prospectively a drain into the environment from within the protein. The reason for this landscape is shown more or less on the next slide, where the same hemes have been identified in terms of their number, and they're colored in terms of redox potential, as calculated by MD, with light green hemes being the low potential hemes at the tops, say the tops of the hills, and the dark hemes being the sinks. So heme 7 is the darkest, it's the, the lowest in the free energy landscape. And the reason for that, we think, is because of local charged amino acids that create an electropositive environment around heme 7, which makes it attractive to electrons in the chain. Conversely, at hemes 4 and 9, which has local electronegative functionalities present, that makes it harder to reduce those sites. So these are the tops of the hills that the electrons would have to surmount uh, to get through the protein and along the chain. The explanation, as far as we can tell, for the features in the free energy landscape, as calculated by MD, have to do with the local distribution of electropositive and electronegative charged amino acids or functionalities such as propionate groups. What we then need to do to really fully understand electron transfer along this wire is to get the rest of the Marcus electron transfer parameters, and as shown in this next slide, We've used molecular dynamics now to calculate the reorganization energy. The reorganization energy is basically going to be the energy to move an electron from a donor heme to an acceptor heme without changing the local environment. And what you see here are parabolas uh, centered at each of the heme redox potentials in the free energy landscape. And the intersection of the parabolas, for example, from 10 to 9, the intersection point or the crossing point is the so-called diabatic activation energy that has to be surmounted during an electron transfer from 10 to 9 or 9 to 10. This is the so-called Marcus reorganization energy as calculated by molecular dynamics. Step beyond would then be to get the quantum mechanical coupling between each of the heme pairs to get the so-called transfer integral, which would then give us the three components that are needed to calculate a rate of electron transfer, namely the redox potential, the reorganization energy, and the electronic coupling. So, and that kind of work is a work in progress, and we hope to have this kind of information published here uh, in the next few months.